your lord the king Ooh, has returned <laughs> to bring you guys and gals some wholesome family friendly heartwarming and enlightening content the one piece top 50. amazing <laughs> Yay, oh my god. If you don't know, now you know. I did a One Piece Top 50 Strongest Character Stream over on my Cole Requiem channel on Saturday. And I invited a whole bunch of content creators, influencers across the spectrum. I had Rogers Bass there. I had the Volume One podcast there. Just Josh, not Megan. I had Brago there. I had Chestnut Tanuki and Hime. They're there too. I, I even had the legendary Taekwon make an appearance. Whoa. So if you were not aware, that this stream happened, you can check that out in the description box down below. This is a 12 hour extravaganza. This, woohoo! It was a good time for damn sure. Toxic, yes. Cancerous, yes. But a good time nonetheless. You can absolutely enjoy yourself in the filth, in the muck that is the power scale. And let's keep it a stack here too. That's why you're watching this video. Duh. Somewhere in the back of your homo sapien mind, some instinct is firing off saying, top 50 strongest characters in One Piece? I gotta see what's what. Hey, yo, I, my glands are salivating. I wanna take a nice big old chunk of the toxicity. This is my video breaking down my list particularly and why I rank characters where they were ranked. New characters are doing new things Old characters are doing new things, and, and we are all over the place when it comes to where characters lie in terms of their combat skills relative to one another. Of course, for characters that are only that are only alive, and off the rip, a few things. One in my list, I did not include the five elders, the Gorose, because honestly, I, I still don't know where to rank them right now. I have to see more of St. J. Garcia Saturday, and I don't know if, let's say, Ethan or Topman or Marcus Mars. I don't know if these people are that far apart in power or if there's actual gaps between the two. Like, the gap between Saturn and Topman is massive. Comparable to, let's say, Jack and Kaido. Maybe? But, but I have no idea. So that's why my list are off the list. One, two. Is that Darling and the Holy Knights? No idea. Uh, actually, unironically, no idea off the list. Three is Kuma is doing a lot of different things. But I did not rank Kuma because I actually don't know. I can't tell if Kuma is stronger now or was in the pre time skip. Because now we're seeing armor hockey and all kind of stuff. At the same time, he's still a vegetable in his mind. He's still lacking a lot of those human emotions. Therefore, his intelligence, battle IQ, uh, all these things would be missing. And this list only involves characters that are alive. So I thought, okay, it's kind of confusing. And to make things simple, he can be left off the list, technically speaking. Though other characters that are in the gray, like Big Mom and Kaido, I think they're alive. So they're on my list. Now, that being said, let's get right into my top 50 strongest characters in one piece as of 2023 plus the beginning of 2024 with January. Number 50 is Pedro Spero. Number 49 is Jack the Drought. Number 48 is Kozuki Momonosuke, the adult version of Momonosuke. Number 47 is Kaku. Number 46 is Charlotte Cracker. Number 45 is Killer. Number 44 is Edward Weevil. Number 43 is S Shark. Here come my Seraphim now. So 43 is a shark. 42 is a snake. 41 is a bear. And 40 is a hawk. 39 is Don Quixote do Flamingo. 38 is Ivankov, Eva Chan. 37 is NL. Of, of, of course, Lightning God NL. We still repping the Lightning Overlord strong. After NL, 36 is Charlotte Smoothie. 35 is Queen. 34 is Magellan. See, see this? Again, I, we'll get to that soon enough. 34 is Magellan. 33, Yasha. 32, Jean Bay, aka Ween Bay. 31, King of the Wildfire. 30, Ma Marco, Marco, Fukucho, Marco, the Phoenix, the lad. One of the dopest characters in One Piece, and he starts off my top 30 officially. So Marco is my 30. 
after Marco 29 is Rob Gucci, aka Rob Bababucci, aka Rob Pucci. Rob Lucci is my 29. After Rob Lucci is Vince Smoke Sanji. After Sanji 27, Ronor Zoro. After Zoro 26, Yamato, aka Yama Bro. Uh oh. After Yamato is Boa Hancock at 25. 24 is City of the Rain. 23 is Charlotte Akatakur E. 22 is Sir Crocodile. 21 is Silver's Rayleigh. 20 is Lucky Roo. I don't doubt you. After Lucky Roo, number 19 is Eustace Captain Kido. After that, 18 is Gop. 17 is Sengoku the Buddha. 16 is Trafalgar D. Voltaire Law. 15 is Aramaki Greenbull. 14 is Isho the Purple Tiger. 13 is the Flame, the Flame Emperor Sabo. After Sabo, my 12 is Borsalino Kizaru. After Kizaru, my 11 is Ben Beckman. And my number 10 to kick off the top 10 is Kuzan, the Arara Ice Wonder. After Kuzan, number nine, Monkey D. Luffy, the Nika himself in the top 10. After Luffy, number eight, Dracul Mihoku, the world's greatest, strongest swordsman. After Mihawk, seven, I maintain Shonen Tropes. Monkey D. Dragon. Dragon. After Dragon, number seven, the top living Marine, Sakazuki, the Red Dog, Akainu. After that, number five, Marshall D. Teach. Number four, Charlotte Linlin, Big Mamu herself. Number three, Warrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
for an hour, bro. Like, it, that's insane. And when you consider the fact that he himself also has that dragon ability, we could see in Act 1 of Wano Country how hard it was for Luffy to really damage Kaido at all when Kaido was in dragon form, particularly in the anime when there's a whole sequence there and Kaido is still drunk. On paper, Momonosuke should be able to withstand the same degree of punishment as Kaido could in Act 1 of Wano Country. We have seen Momonosuke on the rooftop bite through Kaido's scales with his teeth, and later on against Green Bull, the Blast Breath. And the Blast Breath, though spammed a lot by Kaido, there's a reason why. If it works, don't fix it, bro. And that attack is still, to this day, extremely powerful. Would literally punch a hole without destroy all the ice mountains that Kuzan made on Quankazer. And I'm talking about like the first iterations of the Blast Breath, not the crazy mega ones we saw Kaido do later on. So I could, let's say in a sense, future scale and assume that Momonosuke, over the course of that week, since the strats took to get from Wano to Egged Island, he's gotten better at X, Y, Z, and the other, but in itself, Momonosuke has a great arsenal and his defenses are top, top notch in the verse as it is. But he needs more experience, he needs more courage and so on and so forth. But Momonosuke has absolutely a tremendous amount of combat potential now. After those guys is Kaku. Kaku fought against two Seraphim, so that is impressive, even though it's off screen. And also he is awakened. Even though we haven't seen much of it, we can see how the awakening of like Luchi is able to allow him to fight against a conquerors hockey infused King of Hell Zoro for like a long period of time. And Kaku, of course, not as strong. I could argue he's probably in that third division role at this point in time, somewhere in like, the top echelon. Some folks may point to the fact that Stussy was able to just defeat him after a good old fashioned suck, but she does admit that she normally couldn't beat people like Luchi or Kaku. She had to sneak them and get the job done that way. So I have him under Cracker and Killer at this point in time, and Killer is the top of my third division sort of characters in terms of their combat skills. After Killer, you have the Seraphim. And then for me, the Seraphim are, for the, for, for the time being, at the bottom of second division. And S Shark is the weakest among the known Seraphim so far, I I I'd argue, because he is 95% complete compared to the other Seraphim when we see S Shark fight against Sanji and company. And what that means exactly, like where is he lacking compared to the other Seraphim, right now it's hard to say. Is it his defense, offense, the amount of times he can use the different power, his cognition, who really knows? But keep in mind that S Shark is a Lunarian Fishman hybrid and fishmen by default have better physical specs than humans do. So you could actually argue by default, physically, he's superior than S Snake and S Hawk because on paper, in theory, human Lunarian mixes wouldn't be as physically endowed as fishman Lunarian mixes, at least on paper. And also because they're younger, I don't know if I can say with confidence that they are stronger than their progenitors, than their actual original counterparts. So I still, let's say, put Do Flamingo over S Flamingo or whatever his name is. Crocodile over S Croc. Though I will make an exception for Gecko Moria and S Gecko or S Bad. Considering how Gecko Moria was perceived to be so weak that they sent Do Flamingo to kill him back in the pre time skip, I have a lot of confidence to say, okay, yeah. S Gecko is probably stronger than Gecko Moria, and probably by orders of magnitude. All the Seraphim are under Do Flamingo, and and Do Flamingo is a very odd case because people give Dofi a lot of future scaling. They kind of assume that Domingo has gotten a lot stronger in prison, even though. We know from Marine Ford, when Mr. One had his clash against Mihawk, he told Crocodile that he got worse in prison with his skills. Now, he could have been cheeky and salty, it's possible, for, for damn sure, but based on Mr. One, Das Bones, who is to say that Dovey's actually gotten stronger? He could have gotten weaker. Mm. Mm. And as it stands, mm. because of Kaido's words about how he considers Jack to be strong, but Dofi to be weak, even though he was drunk at that point in time, it is a slight, I would argue, on Dofi's position in the power scale. Though, albeit his feats are impressive, however, folks take it, I think, a bit too far, and then they kind of say carte blanche that people like uh, Fujitora or people like Sabo, they could not break out of the birdcage. And it's like, no, we're missing so much of the narrative and the context 
of what is going on at that point in time as to why Fujitora and Sabo, even though they had likely the power to break out of the bird cage, they chose not to. And instead, all eggs were in the Luffy basket. And then after Dofi, I do have Ivankov. Eva, shout out to Eva Chan. The thing here is that Ivankov, as far as I can tell, he is the third strongest individual in the Rev at this point in time. And he fought arguably on par with Bartholomew Kuma during Marine Ford, even after all the crazy shenanigans that we saw them go through in Impel Down. So who should really say that Ivanko was going into this battle at his best against Bartholomew Kuma? So let's say if Ivanko and Kuma are similar in power, we can take the idea of Bartholomew Kuma in theory, at his best, mind and hockey and so on, like whatever that looks like, he would still be stronger than Esper. So you could argue that Ivankov is also stronger than the Seraphim based on his performance at Marine Ford when he was arguably in a weakened state after all the stuff dealing with Magellan and company in Impel Down. Now after Ivankov is NL because to this day, to this day, the feats speak volumes and he's doing these feats in an environment that is not best conducive to his powers keep in mind that in the blue sea nl has oh when there are thunderclouds all over the place nl has access to a metric ton of more electricity in the environment around him for damn sure people say things like he's a glass cannon because he lost to a pre time of luffy but look at crocodile bro <laughs> Well, you, you see the gas Crocodile's getting now? Lost to pre time sip Luffy before NL did. Who Bill? Two! Well, damn near, but damn! Bro, to me, NL's in a similar position, though I'll be, I can't say higher than Crocodile now, because Oda hasn't, you know, confirmed or gone to that. What he did say that back then, he was compared to Ace in terms of bounty. He'd be a 500 million berry bounty man. And I'd argue he's not a glass cannon. Keep in mind that even after all the attacks he took from Luffy, a few hours later at nighttime, he literally went to the moon when everyone was asleep, unironically. And he took the reject dial. The reject dial is absurd in terms of the power it can offer. Consider the fact that Luffy compared Rob Lucci's uh, Roke Ogan, his six gun cannon, to an impact dial, but it was a few times stronger. The reject dial is vastly superior. Orders of magnitude more powerful. It multiplies the force of the attack tenfold, tenfold. And God knows just, just how much force was built up in the reject dial before NL took it, bro. The fact that Wiper could just use the reject dial and just destroy damage to the giant Jack with an internal shockwave move, very, very likely in the same camp of ability technique that we saw Marco do to Queen the Plague. The Phoenix brand attack, a shockwave that tends to bypass natural defenses and do internal damage. A similar type of attack did that much damage, that much destruction? <laughs> Randy had a good point on the reject dial during our stream, and I must revisit it because the reject dial is way more powerful than a lot of folks would first think, honest to goodness. After NL though, Smoothie, Strong the Cracker by default, I would say, uh, because of rank and file. Uh, Queen, obviously, top end, second division commander, strong as hell. After that, though, Yasop. Mm. And then here's the thing. Yasop begins the bottom of the first division commanders. And personally, I do rank him under Lucky Roo. They were all very confident in defeating Kid and his crew without Shanks being involved even though Kid's crew got a major buff going out of Wano country. They became strong, even going to Shanks. Like, yo, they got stronger. Don't underestimate them, bro. No soft targets. Woo! The ultimate chapter, 957. No soft targets. Yasop is the bottom of the first division commanders, in my personal opinion. And then Jinbei is the follow-up. Why is the follow-up? Because Jinbei, I think now, has to be comparable. He has to be comparable to Zoro and Sanji. Will this be the case for the entire story? I'm not too sure, but for the time being, absolutely. What folks I think do misguidedly is they look at Jinbei, say he fought against who's who, and as a result, he should be comparable to who's who in terms of power. But, but no, I would argue it's not just being the person, but it's how you beat that person. Both Kaido and Katakuri can beat Smoothie. That does not mean at all 
that Kaido and Katakuri are on the same level. Both Blackbeard and Zoro can beat Pika. That does not mean that they're on the same level. Both Akainu and Inu can beat Jack the Drought. That does not mean they're on the same level. Obviously, it depends on how you get the job done. Gene Bay had who's who. A who's a who. He had him, bro. And my book, I would say that's a mid diff. Mid diff on who's who. If that's the case, then if we upscale Gene Bay to what you can do, let's say, at extreme diff, Jack would be, let's say, a high to extreme diff. Queen could, let's say, be an extreme, extreme diff. That would be the hardest fought W he's ever had in his life. Well, let's say he would stop at King the Wildfire. So, in my personal opinion, this guy, Gene Bay, could potentially beat Queen the Plague, though it'd be hard for him to beat Queen the Plague compared to Sanji being Queen the Plague. But I can still give Jimei that credit, partic particularly, right, when we know for a fact that he beat who's who in an environment that is not best conducive to his powers. Jinbei's best powers are where? In the water. Keep that in mind. Jinbei is beating who's who mid-diff with no water around. If he's in a water environment, which is very abundant in World One Piece, uh oh, <laughs> get ready, get ready for Ween Bay, baby. So Gene Bay, I think, is underrated by a lot of folks. He is way stronger than you would realize. And all I have to do is remember, oh yeah, he's beating who's who mid diff without any water around him. And who's who is most likely the strongest member of the Flying Six. I do still have King the Wildfire over Gene Bay. Then I have Marco over Gene Bay as well. Then I have Rob Lucci over Gene Bay too. And the reason why is because the same amount of time that Kizaru and Luffy have fought flashback, come back, and got punched by Luffy again in Chapter One Piece, Zoro, as far as we know, has still been fighting Rob Lucci off screen. That's a long time. Maybe not hours, I think, but it's still a long time. Rob Lucci's putting in that work. Zoro is strong as hell. Unless Rob Lucci got beaten off screen and then Zoro got lost, Rob Lucci, if we see him clash against Zoro again, let's say in the next few chapters, yeah. I mean, to me, it's been a long fight so far, which is a buff to Zoro's King of Hell form for sure, in terms of say the time length. However, we have to give Rob Lucci's flowers, I'd argue. So Rob Lucci is close to Zoro, but not as close to Zoro as Sanji, my book, because in my book, Sanji and Zoro are virtually equal. That's how it's been for like the longest time, and I don't see that ever changing, honestly. And I would argue that the Queen versus Sanji and King versus fight situations only prove that point. So let's tackle Zoro and Sanji for a bit here. I have her things kind of against the grain, against Sanji, where, for example, folks will say things like, because Sanji passed out, after his battle against Queen, this is a sign here that that fight is extreme difficulty on Sanji's part to beat Queen to play. However, what this does is it completely removes all context and it assumes that the only reason why Sanji passed out was because of the fight and the fight alone. So it removes, obviously, his body's metamorphosis, where his body was feeling so odd, that he was feeling clunky and he couldn't dodge attacks properly. Even Zoro, when they had their combo on King and Queen, he pointed that fact out like, yo, Sanji, you good? What's going on? His body, according to him, fell off for a pretty long period of time. Not necessarily bad, but definitely off. And at the beginning of chapter 1035, Oda was playing some pretty sly tricks where we actually don't get to see Sanji's face as he passes out. Not even the cover story of chapter 1036. Not until in the middle of 1036 do we see Sanji's face and his eyebrow swirls have returned back to normal. So I can easily argue, it's not even hard to do, that Oda is depicting Sanji's transformation taking a toll on his body. But of course, obviously, this is a minor thing compared to the biggest thing. Two is obviously you're ignoring the massive mental anguish that he's going through during that fight. And I know some folks wanna troll on that and say, oh, it doesn't matter, but that's like missing all what happened Whole Kick Island, how that transpires in Wano Country and how the very thing that he had finally accepted about himself was being forcibly, forcibly changed in his own mind and he couldn't control that. 
Like when you think about somebody that's gone through, let's say, a massive mental breakdown, or think of, let's say, things like Alzheimer's, dementia, how someone's mind can be changing who they are, what you are essentially is mostly your mind. And the key sign for that in his mind was him potentially picking a woman for the first time in the entire story, breaking a, a, a pivotal code of his character, let alone the fact that he accepted the raid suit in Act 1, which gave him one of his dreams, and then he had to sacrifice that dream because it was leading him to stop being himself, which we know at Whole Kick Island, what did Luffy say to Sanji? Well, yeah, I mean, you're you, and that was a... I mean, oh, do I have to really say it? It's a crucial thing for his character. The fight has deep levels to it. And, and to ignore that mental angle she was clearly going through doesn't make any sense. As per usual, what's way more important is how Sanji treated Queen and how Zoro treated King during the fight. And during the fight, there is a comparison between Sanji and Queen and Zoro and King and how their fights are panning out. Because Sanji in chapter 1034 calls out Queen. He tells Queen, hey, yo, dog, me and you, like Hawkman in the Black Adam movie. Me and you, we've been fighting for a while. And I know that you've been taking lasting damage from my attacks. So stop posing, cut the crap. And this is Sanji before he goes Ifrit. And mind you, we're not too sure if Marco's Phoenix Brand attack did lasting damage to Queen the Plague. But Sanji's attacks did. And in the anime, in episode 1061, the attack that he's referring to specifically is the grill shot. The grill shot did lasting damage to Queen, but Queen played off like a wrestler, like it was Ric Flair, he sold it. And the grill shot is weaker than some of the attacks that Sanji does to Queen later on during their fight, particularly the Hell's Memories. And Queen had no retort against Sanji's comments. This is before he goes Ifrit, which means what? This means Sanji in Devil Lake form with his Germa enhancements activating is pretty much equal to Queen. That's what that means. Because we can see with those enhancements, Sanji can endure damn near any attack that Queen gives him. He is, of course, dodging those laser beams because they're deadly. However, all the attacks that did hit Sanji, he did take, he did endure, including the German attacks and the Brachiocoilus, which is meant to even suppress and subdue high tier, some of the strongest armament hockey users. However, in Zoro's case, we see the opposite. In chapter 1032, Zoro states, that if he does not figure out the secret of King the Wildfire, he cannot beat King. And that was Zoro before the King of Hell state had activated in his swords. And he was on the verge of losing. And mind you, this is before Enma starts to interfere with Zoro's fight against King. So once Sanji goes Ifrit, he just smites Queen. And then once Zoro goes King of Hell and figures out King's powers, now we can have a genuine back and forth between Zoro and King, and then ultimately Zoro catches that fat W. But keep in mind that when Zoro does use King of Hell, according to him in 1033, outputting that level of hockey for too long would kill him. But Sanji doesn't have any of those issues, as far as we know, with Ifri Jambe. These are the facts the facts of the matter. And I'd argue, personally speaking, that if King the Wildfire and Queen the Plague fought, King is winning for sure, but it's not an easy fight for King to beat Queen. I'd argue that that's gonna be a high to extreme diff on King's part to beat Queen the Plague. That's our argue. So ultimately speaking, Zoro and Sanji maintain form when it comes to how close they are, because what Oda did is what he always does in the pre-time skip, where Sanji always has an easier time defeating number three than Zoro does number two. That's how he maintains equilibrium, and that has not changed. Wano Country only solidified, it repeats. We have seen time and time and time again in the pre-time skip. And Queen is stronger, I'd argue, than every person that Luffy and Zoro beat before Wano Country outside of the Katakuri. And if you really want to gas him, Doflamingo. You're goddamn right. But that's it. Now, you've noticed that I did something odd this year where I put Yamato over Zoro and over Sanji. I did not do that last year, but this year I did do that. Why? Yamato is not part of the crew. So when she joins the crew in the future, which I think she will, she has to be pretty damn strong 
by default. Like I would argue probably in that first division commander spot when she joins the crew. Now you may say, hold on now, based on my list, Jinbei, Zoro, Sanji, and Yamato would all be in this camp? Yeah, because it's gonna be the Pirate King's crew. Luffy's crew is going to be the strongest crew in pirate history even compared to Goldie Rogers crew. Luffy's crewmates are going to be able to beat any other crew that will exist in the history of the series, bar none. And Yamato has to be on that level at a bare minimum. So I figured, okay, fine. There's a good chance here that let's say she's gonna be stronger than Zora and Sanji. Let's say up until this arc, or let's say up until they get actual significant buffs that we see and then, okay, now they are stronger than Yamato in terms of their overall combat skills. Because what she did against Kaido, it was pretty impressive. I would say, albeit a bit overrated, but still impressive nonetheless. And then, and then let's say even uh, if she comes back to the crew before Elbath for like whatever reason, at that point in time, she'll be weaker than Zoro and Sanji. So after Yamato is Boa Hancock, because I'll buy the bounty sauce for both Boa Hancock and Crocodile. I will buy the bounty sauce and put them over most first division commanders at this point in time. Crocodile's bounty is, is literally close to Blackbeard's bounty at the beginning of the post time skip. Just, just, just think about that. The man that could defeat Marco and company in the payback war. That is the person Crocodile is approaching in terms of bounty. That's kind of nuts. And if I really, really wanted to, I could power creep and raise Crocodile even more based on, of course, the Mihawk Clash and him also tagging a Kainu and also saving Ace under Sengoku's watch during Marine Ford. But all that gets, <laughs> all that gets hella messy. But there is the idea, the theory that Crocodile could be already awakened. There might be science for this, but I'm gonna save that for maybe, maybe another video another day. And Bo's powers are known to be busted she has all three hockey types, Armit, Opposition, and Conqueror's Hockey, and Boa has a bag. Boa has an absurd bag of abilities to use. And yeah, BB did catch her off guard in Amazon Lily, but that's Blackbeard. Even he admits that, listen, if he's a little bit, you know, pent up, blue balled up, horn dog up, oh, he may be susceptible to even her ability. So I think that she's very powerful, I'll buy it. She is up there with the other first division command, actually better than them for the most part, most of them, not all of them, but most of them. And the situation involving Crocodile and Boy Hancock, I'd argue inadvertently affects another character and that character is Magellan. So Magellan at 34 and he's on my list because Magellan I think in some ways now has to be in relation relative to City of the Rain but also Crocodile too. Cause Crocodile and Jinbei and all these guys, they ran, they ran like cowards from Magellan in Impel Down. It is theorized, it's theorized that Magellan, his Venom Demon could be his awakening because it's actually poisoning the solid stone around them. How do you poison stone itself? I, I don't know. That seems kind of weird, but if he's awakened, then his premise of powers will start to affect the other things around him. Ultimately speaking, Magellan, I think, okay, you could argue, he could be in the second division commander-ish spot, let's say under Sea of the Rain, who would, let's say, be a future opponent for Zoro, who, let's say, would be in that top first division spot, because Sea of the Rain did get better over the course of the time skip, naturally one, by default, because that's how it works. And then two, he got the invisibility fruit. So since City of the Rain is comparable to Magellan in the pre-time skip, that's what's stated. And City of the Rain got all these buffs. And because Magellan was <laughs> like apparently demoted and now Hanya Ball's in charge, let's say they only Magellan got slightly better, maybe like teeny, eeny, wincy bit better, then I'm comfortable putting him a whole tier below the guy that he was compared to in the pre-time skip that we know got better. And the same thing I would argue applies to Crocodile too, just based on the sauce that Oda is giving Crocodile. And that is a lot of sauce. So Magellan being someone I think, okay, around the top of the signature commander, I think it's fair relative to Seed of the Rain. And then also Weevil, who's at like my 44 now, because he got all screen right Green Bull. It's not a good look. Is he strong? Yeah. but. I think that right now we're kind of beyond the point of him being a, let's say a threat 
for the Strat crew. What are the odds of Weevil being stronger than Kizaru when he got off screen by Greenville? The answer is nil. Nigh impossible. So Weevil is in my second division commander spot, somewhere in that bottom round, like 44. Now, Katakuri is 23, he's Katakuri. Katakuri has the Katakuri tax. Even after all of Wild Country and damn near all of Egget Island, he has some of the best observation hockey future sight in the verse, even compared to Luffy. The owner of the character that has better future sight right now than Katakuri in terms of what they've actually shown is Shanks. That's literally it. He was able to time Snake Man instantly, instantly. And even Kaido couldn't do that. Now, people say, hold on now. Snake Man should be faster from Wild Country to Hokkaid Island. Maybe, I'm not too sure. Because the ability works by accelerating constantly. That's how it works. So is his baseline speed more? I'm not too sure. I know he's more powerful because he has more hockey. Is the Conqueror's hockey fusion into that stuff. Friend of fine, yeah, for sure. But is the speed better? I'm not too sure. I, I actually don't know. But what I will say, is that Future Sight continues to look better and better, and that Olenix Katakuri look what? Better and better. The man has all three hockey types, including the Conqueror's hockey. His arm and hockey at a baseline was even overpowering Snake Man Luffy's arm and hockey, and he's awakened. He's awakened, man. Katakuri has a massive, a huge bag. People do things like, well, he took like 13 hits against Luffy that we saw in the entire like fight. And it's like, wait a minute now, the fight lasted hours. We don't see every punch and kick that Katakuri took. Similar to let's say Garp and Kuzan, Katakuri and Luffy fought off screen for a long period of time. We don't see every punch and kick he took. And even still, he let him go into Snake Man. He didn't use the most spear. He was still talking to Brulee after the... No, no, no. Mm, mm, mm. I, I, I can't. <laughs> I cannot. I cannot. After Katakuri, I put Silver's Rayleigh over Katakuri. I normally would never do that. But last year, something massive happened. And this, to me, I thought was, in terms of power scale, I thought it was the most important thing Oda had did. Almost as close to Doriki in terms of actually ranking physical power. He gave every admiral a three billion berry bounty carte blanche via the cross skill. The admirals are people who are what? They are given that position because of their combat skills. Dolph Flamingo literally says as much in chapter 713, where he literally calls Fujitora and Green Bull, powerful monsters that the Navy got during the international military draft. They are the folks that the social dragon they rely on when it comes to uh, delivering quote unquote justice to evildoers against them. Kizaru is literally escorting one of the most powerful people on the planet because these people value his what? his power, his combat skills. The admirals are given their position because of their combat skills. And if Oda is saying every admiral is worth three billion berry, what does that mean? That means that someone in the world of One Piece who is truly worth a bounty of three billion is comparable to an admiral in their combat abilities. That in my book makes the most sense why Oda would give every admiral the same bounty. Every Admiral, and that includes Garp. Garp Chujo has the same bounty as every current Admiral, every last one of them. And based on the lore of things, Garp was headhunting Roger back in the day, not Rayleigh. And Roger himself does refer to Garp and Sengoku in the Odin flashback looking for good adversaries to fight against. And Rayleigh is not on the level of Goldie Roger. So if Garp currently is comparable to a Navy Admiral, then I could argue that Rayleigh would be under Garp. So Garp is in that Admiral pool for me, but Rayleigh is just out of the Admiral pool. And I would say it does match up what we saw in the pre-time skip, because I would argue that in a prolonged fight, Kizaru is beating Rayleigh in the pre-time skip. Yes, absolutely. I'm putting money on Kizaru. Though, I know a lot of folks want to take the whole Blackbeard thing, like, oh, Blackbeard, skittish in the anime, the ground shaking, it's the Shanks red hockey. 
The man admits he had no chance of beating Blackbeard H. Oh, no. He's not beating Blackbeard. He's being humble. No, no, no. No, no, I don't hear it. And then the really have Lucky Roo. Why? Because Lucky Roo, same reason why I raised the ass off from last year. No soft targets and the entire crew gets a buff. Not only is it because we find out that they are confident taking on Kid and his crew, but also we find out that the entire Shanks Armada is ass. Shanks has the weakest Yonko Armada out of any other Yonko. Luffy now. Big Mom, uh, Kaido, Blackbeard, they all have better armadas than Shanks does. So what does that mean? That means that the core crew must be elevated. They have to be elevated to compensate for the lack of power that the red hair armada is. No, woo! Brand new, what do you say again? Brand new said no soft targets. Mm. Lucky Roo is up there. I think he's almost he's teetering. I could be wrong teetering on that admiral goodness and now we get to the admiral goodness itself and the admiral goodness i think starts off with eustace captain kid people just fainted if you're still here fainted heart attack but on the way down click that like button click it yeah baby listen i understand kid gets dunked on a lot he does because kid did not look impressive at all on the rooftop compared to Killer. One. Two is that him and Law, they don't necessarily beat Big Mom clean. It's like Big Mom is still conscious on the way down, grabs a bomb on the way down, and she's still yapping about Roger Watt, all this stuff, right? Three. The one shot. The Shanks, uh, I'm wearing red for a reason. And then that was it. And then his boy Killer was free fries on the side. That, that was radical. Oh, that was nuts. But what have I been saying now for a while? It's not a kid thing, it's a Shanks thing. That's just how good Shanks is. Not to say that kid is bad, because on paper, kid does have a long list of durability and endurance feats. And what folks always tend to neglect is kid's utility. His ability sets are pretty damn high. Keep in mind that Big Mom normally can negate powers, but Kid could still apply magnetism to Big Mom despite her tremendous hockey. And yes, he did throw Kaido, which doesn't look as good as, you know, Killer Seth or Sonic. At the same time, Kaido in terms of size is massive. He's huge in dragon form straight up drake status and throwing them around them itself is a very impressive thing to do just it, it just in of itself we see when he finally gets shanks in that future that never happened he can do nine damn punks in like a 10 second interval and two damn punks could damage the derby queen big mom so kid he does have feats and his strength in terms of like utility strength not like physically, but making all these creations that can move around and slam Kaido, that can put pressure on Big Mom, that can literally be used as a shield mechanism against attacks so Kid takes a lot less damage from oncoming attacks, which I think apply to the Big Mom Elbat Spear, the same attack that Luffy dodged when he ran to Big Mom in the lower layers of Onigashima. So in a roundabout way, his utility with metal increases his strength, his durability, his endurance, and other baseline stats like that. And he does have those endurance and durability feats. Those things cannot be ignored. He was going through hell when he had Hawkins and Killer stab him through the chest, through the shoulder, X, Y, Z, and the other. He was going through hell, and he still managed to endure and fight. And this guy survived like the barrage of the 3,000 leagues of Mother Misery, at least in the anime. In the manga, it looks kind of weird, but we know that one swipe of that thing would literally vaporize people out of existence. They got vaporized out of existence, and Kid can handle and survive a barrage of this thing. So, look, man, I think it was in 2021 or 2022, that top 30, I had to accept that no matter what, Kid had to be close to Law 
in most ways, shapes, and form because that's how Oda was clearly portraying those characters, where Law and Kid were absolutely relative in various ways, and Luffy was ahead of those guys. And even though I was not a fan of that at all, because a Kid is not a cup of tea, he's not, he's really not, I had to accept that. I had to bite the bullet, and I had to accept that as this is what Oda kind of intends to do, let's just go with it. Even though I don't want Kid to be stronger than let's say Zora and Sanji on paper, I think he has to be based on the feats, but mostly based on the narrative, the narrative of where Kid should be in terms of power. That matter, I think that narrative, the story, portrayal, these things matter just as much as the feats, what a character actually does on screen or off screen, yes. So, and Kid's narrative is in parallel with Law. And as of recent, more importantly, because there's a three billion berry bounty, his narrative is now in lockstep with the Admirals. So in some, not all, but in some ways, he is relative to a Kizaru, to a Greenwall, to a Fujitora, to a Garp, to, again, Law, who also shares a three billion berry bounty. Because it seems like people that are earnestly worth that bounty should be comparable in some ways to admirals. And for the sake of accurate power scale, I think that's a bullet I have to bite on. But the Overton window for Kid has shifted so much to where Kid used to be neck and neck with Luffy to the point where folks say that he's weaker than King the Wildfire, Queen the Plague, Jack the Drought, Cracker. It's, it's, it's nasty work. It's absolutely nasty work just because they fell out of favor with Kid so much. But if you always remember what Shaki had said about Kid, where the only reason why Kid had a higher bound than Luffy in the pre-time skip was because he attacked civilians, then you would have known that yes, okay, it's very likely that Kid is not on Luffy's level. Still strong, but not as strong as Luffy. But Ryan not argue that Zoro and Sanji have a ways to go before they're even on Kid's level, on God. They have to be as strong as an Admiral, and right now, they're not. And Law, Trafalgar D is my 16th, cause he's just nuts. The broken abilities, the tactics, black beard, ugh, and Law were clashing. Quake fists that are probably hockey infused with his awakening. That's also probably hockey infused too. And keep in mind that Blackbeard counters every devil fruit user. And still after it's all said and done, this man Blackbeard, huffing. <sighs> <coughs> Buddy, you counter him. What are you doing? No. To this day, Law has some of the nuttiest feats in the verse by far. This man's puncture willy is absolutely radical. Made a hole just as deep as Luffy's Bajran gun from an elevated position, several times the length of the whole island of Onigashima. This man's sword would literally travel to Skypea and back three times over, and it's nothing but pure, unadulterated, internal shockwave, my boy. No. <laughs> And Law is even stronger now compared to his Wano country counterpart. The man is a phenom. Nuff said. Garp, 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 garp Chujo. It's my number 18. I've understand Goku. Real quick, my theory is that Duffu users may not wane the same way over the course of time compared to non Duffu users. We know that Garp had physical strength and hockey up damn wazoo. But even the man himself is like, yo, uh, I'm not the same man I used to be. The gray hairs exist for a reason. And Garp is clearly someone that's focused on physical strength and hockey. But Devil Fruits may not weigh in the same way because Sengoku has likely decreased in physical strength and hockey. But Devil Fruits, once you know an ability, do you really lose that power? We see Whitebeard do the same oceanic tilt in the Odin flashback and in Marine Ford. But you could argue back then it was way easier when he was younger, but when he was older, it was harder, required more stamina. And to be fair, it's on the heels of what? Squad stab, heart attack, cannons, bullets, all these things, right? He's not in the best condition 
when he does that tilt. So if white beaters are base, maybe you can apply the same thing to Sengoku, where Sengoku can do the same exact things he could do in his youth, but they require more stamina. Now, Garp did fight against Kuzan, and Kuzan is my number 10, and Garp's my number 18. Garp is in the Admiral range over Kid, but he just does not have, <laughs> he just does not have the feats of Trafalgar D Water Law, man. Woo! Law, law is, my God, bro. <laughs> law is crazy. Two, it's heavily implied, heavily implied, that Garp and Kuzan had a prolonged battle off screen that we, the viewers, don't see. That's how when their fight started, they were both clean, but in chapter 1087, after a prolonged period of time, when Garp's ship that was in the plaza has now moved back to the water, he has Kobe, Helmeppo, and Goose on his side, and we see Garp, he has these wounds on him, his clothes are in tattered, Kuzan pulls back up, like, hey, yo, Garp, I told you, I can't let you leave, and then Garp says, do you still wanna go? The idea here is that they fought off screen. I know, I know people are like, well, actually, um, the reason why Garp has all these wounds and his clothes are in tatters because of the fodder. But what did Kuzan say in that very same chapter? He told all the fodder, all the scrubs to back off because those guys, they can't handle Garp even if his legs and arms were tied. And every attack that he takes from Garp, he comes back and he powers through. Garp, a Conqueror's Hockey Infusion user, could not put down a non-Conqueror's Hockey Infusion user in Kuzan. And in fact, in 1081 and in 1087, it is strongly hinted at that Kuzan is holding back. He is hesitating. And I know folks will say, well, okay, well, Garp got jumped. Garp didn't get jumped when he had literally a whole Marine battalion there with him. Yeah, Kobe messed up for damn sure, for, for damn sure. And Gruus and Helmeppo, mainly Helmeppo, they're not like studly dudes, for damn sure. Though I will give Gruus his flowers because he did block a falling mountain arm, the debris of that arm that Kobe destroyed. But nonetheless, between Kuzan and Garp, even though Garp was phenomenal, what did Rayleigh say at the end of the pre-time skip to not doubt that is strength. Well, Kuzan was doubting extremely, and that was noted to two times, and he still, he still did not go down. He even matched Conqueror's Hockey Infusion punches with Armored Hockey and his Ice Glove. And we now know that he has similar strength, at least, to Garp, because he was also doing the Battleship Bags. So Garp gets a lot of flowers from me, and in the grand scheme of the power scale, I think it's fair to put him where I put him right now, and actually that's very similar to what I had him in 2022. But Kuzan is also validating why this guy fought against Akainu for 10 days and 10 nights. What good are all your attacks if you can't put the guy down? I do have Ben Beckman at 11 because Ben Beckman, no soft targets. Everyone gets a buff in that crew by default because they are confident enough in taking down Kid again without Shanks being involved. One and two, their armada, their fleet is the weakest, and it's known for being the weakest out of any emperor. So the officers have to all be stronger to make up for the lack of strength in the subordinate crew. Luffy's at nine, actually down from last year, I actually lowered him. Cause to me, it was very apparent that yeah, the stamina problems are still there. Right now, I can't say that he's over Mihawk, not yet. I would say, let's say during and after Elbath, fine, but, but, but not now. Even though Kizaru was at an advantage given the environment because Luffy had to go through the Labo Stratum two times and took added damage because of that. And ultimately he did stun lock Kizaru. Kizaru wasn't permanently put down. The stamina does hammer's ability. He does eat the food. Though in theory, in theory, if he really, really wanted to, Luffy could just restart that funky beat and then go into gear five again. But I believe that takes like lifespan. Kaido said that he would kill himself, but Luffy committed nonetheless. So right now between, let's say Luffy and Kizaru, it's very clear that Luffy has an attack that can put down Kizaru since we know that his White Star gun is not his best attack. And Kizaru has yet to show a ability, a technique of some kind that can actually put down Luffy in gear five. So right now in gear five, Luffy is being Kizaru nine and a half times out of 10, honestly. But because he lets it go only five for, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, if he can't get the job done then, then he's in trouble. And that's always been a problem with Luffy. And I still maintain tropes when it comes to the father-son stuff uh, in Shonen. So I, I do put Dragon over Luffy, though 
Whew, it's been a tough year for Dragon, a very tough year for Dragon. If Elbath is over and still Dragon nothing, I'm, I'm gonna probably put Dragon under Luffy come the end Elbath, honestly. But we have to wait and see. Uh, then afterwards, I do have a Kainu as the top Marine right now in the verse. I would, my assumption is that a Kainu is going to be a, in terms of the cross guild, a 3.5 or a 4 billion berry man. Kaido, Big Mom, it is what is there. Though I'll argue that Big Mom, I think in the future is gonna be stronger than Kaido because I think she'll come back as a villain in El Bath against Luffy and company, and then she'll have her trilogy and be beaten in earnest in El Bath. That's all I'd say, honestly. To cap it all off, Shanks over Emu. Here's the thing. I'm assuming, I'm assuming that Emu is the one that did that damage to Sabo. If that's the case here, powerful attack. It couldn't put down Sabo, not like Kid and Shanks, no. It didn't take down Cobra the first time, no, which is interesting, but Sabo took a lot of damage with that attack. And some of the T3 guys didn't mention the idea that maybe Emu's abilities could do more damage to devil users. Interesting. So this could, let's say, involve the whole Umi C. Maybe it's an Umi Bozu, a mythical water demon yokai, right? And Emu did also snuff out Sabo's rook check. But the reality is, when it comes to the feats, Shanks' feats are nuts. Literally has, right now, the greatest hockey feat in the story of all time by baby shaking, just trouncing Green Bull from like a thousand plus miles away outside of the borders of Wano country. And then recently, he one tapped kid, someone else that's also, I'd argue, comparable to an admiral in some ways. And Killer, who I'd argue is a commander level person, was extra fries on the side. Let alone the future site that he used to see Kid's attack. Let alone him crossing like a vast distance to get to Kid's ship because they were docked at shore and somehow Shanks went from the shore to where Kid's ship was at and then just devastated. Bro, <laughs> oh my God. Shanks's feats are ludicrous. But let's say outside of the feats, right? In terms of the narrative, the portrayal, Emu is among the three people that I think could potentially be the final fight for Luffy in the story. I did a villain that one over here, check it out, boom. But basically, it's either gonna be Emu, Blackbeard, or Shanks as the final fight for the series. People sleep, they sleep. On Blackbeard. There's a good chance that BB is making his plays, trying to amass the power of the Holy Land, of the world government. And if that's the case, BB could usurp Emu for, let's say, the final great war of the story. It's possible. It could be Blackbeard's thing, not Emu's thing. But this is all theory based stuff that I have to tackle in future videos. For the power scale, one thing that I did see a lot of people in my chat, and also uh, I think Hidden Island was a big supporter of this idea, where Emu essentially is the king of the world, and it is true that Emu does sit on the true throne of the world. But keep in mind that when they say the world, they talk about the parts of the world that they control. The world government, the marines do not control the new world. The new world, for as far as we've known, the new world has been pirate, has been Yonko, emperor territory, and Emu, who is the head of the world government and all the Gorosei have not been able to control that part of the world. It was Akainu who put the new Marine Ford in the new world at the very edge of the new world. Not deep in new world waters, no. At the very edge of the new world. Whether it's the Pone Glyphs, the new world, or the Nika, there are things that are beyond Emu's control. So I don't think the assumption of saying, well, Emu is like the god of the world, some sort of celestial being that controls the entire planet, therefore number one. I mean, I guess if that's your take, ultimately they're fair enough, fine. But I need to see a lot more from Emu to give them the status of the numero uno. That's why I go with the God King, because in terms of what they've actually shown, oh yeah, God King is nuts, nuts. And I'm not giving Emu the UFO over Lucia Kingdom. No, 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 that, is powered by like Mother Flame stuff, not quite as Vega Punk. So is this Vega Punk now the strongest person on the planet? No. So that being said, ladies and gentlemen, we are done. Fini. This is my One Piece top 50 strongest characters as of 2023 plus January. And the reasons why I grade the characters where they are, in my personal opinion. Once again, the full stream 
is on my Cole Requiem channel with all those content creators. And if you did enjoy this video, make sure to give it a like, subscribe to the channel, and click on that bell to join the notification squad. Thank you, Jafar from Afar, from editing this video. And I'm gonna catch you guys on the flip side. Be easy, stay safe, have a nice one. Bye-bye.